welcome back to my channel. Um, bear with me here over the summer the attic has turned into a sauna and I'm not keen on getting heat stroke so I've been trying to figure out alternative places where I can film and um, it's this will work for right now I suppose. But a while back I was talking to a family member um, just about different things but they ended up bringing up the fact that historically if you wanted the right to vote you had to be a property owner and they made the comment that maybe we should go back to that as if it would resolve some type of political issue now um i'm not at all interested in getting into modern day politics in this video at all but it kind of made me think this might be an interesting topic to explore just you know what were the requirements for suffrage back then and kind of the winding path through the colonial period that eventually led to where we are now. Um, and when I use the term suffrage, it literally means the right to vote. So it's not referring to a particular group of people, um, which is why, you know, we have to say women's suffrage when we talk about the activities of, of women to try to get the vote, because suffrage in and of itself just means the right to vote. And that's the context, that's the definition, so that you understand what I'm about to get into. Um, so when I say that this is a video about suffrage during the colonial period, it's, it's the whole, it's the whole shebang, which is complex. It, it's extensive. Every colony had its own requirements for suffrage and every colony went through multiple versions of that before they, you know, actually got to where we are now with all adults, um, you know, unless you're a felon or something being able to vote in our elections. Uh, I'm not going to be able to cover all of that in this video because I am trying to keep it a little bit briefer than most of my videos, but I'm going to try to just give you a general idea of what it was like and some of the, the changes that happened during the colonial period. Um, but before we get started, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below and hit the bell so that you do get notified the next time I post a video. Now, as with so much in our colonial American history, a lot of it got brought over from England, uh, from their customs and their laws. So if we're going to talk about suffrage in colonial America, we have to talk about suffrage in England just briefly before we get started. And in England, the, the normal rules for suffrage, what they were used to, was that in order to vote, you had to be, you know, an adult male, you had to own property. And uh, that actually goes back to the year 1430 that that was instituted. And at that time, you had to be a real property owner with an annual income of at least 40 shillings. So this is kind of the background of where we started. And then it went through various changes and <sighs> it was a start. Now, in early colonial Virginia, we had what is called Bacon's Rebellion. Not discussed a lot, but fairly important in the history of colonial Virginia. And this is where servants and, you know, frontiersmen ended up getting pitted against the wealthy planners who controlled colonial Virginia politics. So, to an extent, you know, the rights of the, the freemen and, you know, the right to vote was a part of that. But it wasn't the entirety of that conflict. Because, you know, even once they'd come here to the colonies and they had their own culture developing and were having to create their own laws, this was something where the majority of colonists accepted, you know, the status quo. They accepted the fact that not everyone should be able to have the right to vote. That was fine. Um, and, and they accepted the idea of tying it to owning real property, that is owning land. In fact, at the beginning, that's really what the requirement was. It wasn't until 1723, um, a century pretty much after the founding of Jamestown, when colonial Virginia would limit um, the vote to white men. Up until that point, if you had property, your skin color didn't matter. You were technically permitted to vote. But in 1723, they banned black men from voting in colonial Virginia. Now, in the right to vote. Um, Alexander Kessar, 
also mentions that religion mattered in terms of the colonial suffrage, with Catholics and Jews being barred from the vote in multiple colonies. Um, I think it was five colonies for one of those and, and four for the other. And in 17th century Massachusetts, uh, suffrage was limited to the members of the congregational church. So you could be a white man of property, but if you weren't part of the congregational church, you didn't have the right of suffrage. Um, and his work goes into considerable detail. So if you want to know more about this, that is a great work to check out. As always, I, you know, I put a full bibliography down in the description box so you can look there if you're interested in reading more. So the American Revolution, you know, complaint of taxation without representation was really a little bit of a stretch because at best it was the elite that wanted to solidify their power in the colonies and the other colonists simply liked the idea of kind of home rule, right? That, that the laws would at least be made here, even if it was the men of wealth who owned most of the land who would probably be making these laws. So a lot of colonists really weren't going to be represented either way. So, you know, when we're talking about the American Revolution and the reasons there, we do kind of have to remember the limitations of that representation. A lot of them, they weren't going to have it either way. And I think a lot of the founding precepts, which I may have mentioned before in a video, um, it, it was more of a goal that we were, we wanted to aspire to versus something that the founders actually accomplished at that time and in their lifetimes. It, it's something that we have worked towards since then. Um, our founding documents frequently use words like freedom and liberty, and, and then we kind of have to extrapolate their meaning in more detail. As Pauline Meyer writes in her book, American Scripture, Making the Declaration of Independence, quote, they suggested enough different meanings of the word equality equal rights, equal access to office, equal voting power, to keep Americans busy sorting them out and fighting over practices that seemed inegalitarian far into the future, end quote. So then what was the reasoning for the colonists to accept this limited suffrage at that time and think that it seemed reasonable? Um, it had to do with their understanding of, of what it meant to be dependent on someone else. By their logic, if you owed someone something, um, then you weren't in a position to make a decision for yourself politically. So, you know, by custom, that means, you know, women were dependent either on their husbands or on their fathers. Therefore, they wouldn't have the vote because they're not going to be making a decision independently when it comes to voting. So, you know, that was always the case. Likewise, servants or tenants who didn't own their own land, they're going to be dependent on, you know, their employer or, you know, the person that they rent their land from. So they're not, even though they're, even though they could be white and, and male, they're not independent. So the thought was they're going to be influenced in their decision making when it comes to voting on politics. Um, but the thought of that time was, you know, like I said, unless you're a white male, 21, and own property, you would just be too influenced by other people over you. You, you couldn't make a decision for yourself, right? Um, but even in the instances where people actually fulfilled the requirements, I would assert that they probably weren't all that independent as they wanted to think they were, um, you know, in making their decisions politically. Because you know, there, there's still instances where clearly someone had some form of influence over them. In the radicalism of the American Revolution, Gordon Wood gives a number of examples where men of wealth, um, including John Hancock, would use that wealth to create employment or some form of patronage specifically for the sake of having influence over other people, over the lower classes. Um, and this kind of demonstrates the futility of their whole explanation of trying to be independent because, you know, unless you had your own independent wealth where no one can really do anything to you, you're still going to be dependent on someone. You know, you could be a farmer who has, you know, a significant amount of acreage, uh, you know, you have a significant enough income every year, but you're still dependent on someone buying your crops. Um, you know, you could be a tradesperson. And of course, that was 
that was difficult anyway because there were requirements in some colonies that you had to own land too. But anyway, you know, let's say you're a tradesperson and you otherwise fulfill the requirements, but you're still dependent on people to buy your goods to make your income. So the idea of, you know, independent versus dependent um, was really not as clear cut as they wanted to act like it was even back then. Um, you know, everyone's dependent on someone. That's the whole part of society, of, you know, commerce and our economy and everyone buying goods from one. It just, it, everyone's dependent on someone in some way, unless you are wealthy, which goes back to the wealthy planters, the elite in whatever colony having most of this power. Um, I mean, in, in 1825, so decades after the American Revolution, after the adoption of our Constitution, uh, Rhode Island, Virginia, and Louisiana were still holdouts against universal suffrage just for white men. So in those states, even if you are a white man, there were still other requirements in order to be able to vote. So this was a long, long drawn out evolution to get where we are today. Um, and, you know, I mentioned that before 1723, black men, if you had enough, um, if you were a free man and you had enough property, you were allowed to vote. And it's like we went backwards. So the topic of suffrage in the colonies is so far from clear cut. It's not like we were just continuously making progress. We were, it was kind of, you know, two steps forward, a step back, and sometimes more than one step back. Um, you know, but that's not the only example of a colony that had allowed people the right of suffrage and then removed it. Uh, New Jersey State Constitution of 1776 had actually permitted single women to vote if they met the property requirements, which was 50 pounds worth of property. Um, so there were actually some women who voted in New Jersey until 1807 when that was changed and it was reverted to only men. Um, from what I've read, there's really no clear cut numbers on, uh, you know, how much of the population was enfranchised, who could vote, who couldn't. This varies by colony and different historians have had different estimates of what the numbers were. Um, but Kesar estimates, estimates that at the eve of the revolution, it was probably less than 60% of adult white males who were eligible to vote. So not 60% of the population, but 60% specifically of adult white men. Um, and when you think about it, that is such a small portion of society that actually had the right of suffrage at that time. Um, I have discussed John Adams' comment in another video, which I did on the Abigail Adams' Remember the Ladies comment, but I will put a link to that video up here in a card just so I'm not repeating the same quotes. Um, but clearly, he kind of had similar thoughts all his life. In 1817, John Adams wrote to James Madison that, quote, the questions concerning universal suffrage and those concerning the necessary limitations of the power of suffrage are among the most difficult. It is hard to say that every man has not an equal right, but admit this equal right, an equal power, and an immediate revolution would ensue, end quote. Of course, revolution had already ensued, uh, granted for slightly different reasoning, but men and boys had picked up arms and fought in battle to create this country where many of them still could not determine their political future. Um, women supported the war in other ways, though we do have cases of a few women fighting as well, uh, typically, you know, in the guise of being a man. Um, but after all that, it was a hard thing to claim that those who had been willing to risk their lives to create a new country were not worthy of being able to vote. Now, as I mentioned before, there will be books listed below if you do want to read more. And for this topic specifically, I suggest Kesar's The Right to Vote. Um, but what do you think? Had you thought all white men were able to vote following the revolution? Did you know there were instances of women and people of color able to vote during the colonial period? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you like the video, please remember to hit that like button. Um, it really helps me out with YouTube's algorithms. 
thank you and I will see y'all again soon in the next video.